Hello everyone, and welcome to Dr. Mercola's Cellular Wisdom, where we peel back the curtain on that mysterious workshop we call the human body. I'm Ethan Foster, your perpetual observer of life's quirks. Some say my superpower is patiently waiting to deliver a single dry remark. And I'm Alara Skye, resident specialist in comedic dismantling and a keen aficionado of all things natural health. Don't worry, we'll get into the nitty gritty of cellular chaos, but I'll also try to make Ethan question every meal he's ever had. Thanks for that, Alara. Always comforting to know I can count on you to shake my dietary confidence. Now, today's topic is a big one, high blood sugar and type 2 diabetes, something that apparently overwhelms our body's cellular machinery, like Lucy Ricardo in a chocolate factory. We're talking about a new angle on the chaos called reductive stress. Exactly. For a long time, everyone's pointed to oxidative stress as the main villain. But guess what? There's another shadowy culprit in this whodunit, reductive stress. It's the quiet neighbor in the story, the one you never suspected, but who was actually building a secret tunnel under your house. So, as I understand it, reductive stress is basically an oversupply of these electron-carrying molecules, right? Think of them like over-enthusiastic volunteers all showing up at the same time with no one to direct them. One key molecule in that mess is NADH. It roams the cell picking up electrons during glucose breakdown. In normal conditions, NADH says, Hey mitochondria, take these electrons off my hands. And the mitochondria politely oblige. But if you have way too much sugar, and thus way too many electrons, NADH gets in line, and soon you've got a traffic jam bigger than a holiday weekend at the airport. So the electron transport chain becomes like a congested freeway during rush hour. Everyone's trying to exit at once, and the resulting frustration eventually leads to road rage. Except here, the road rage is a wave of oxidative damage. People used to think the problem started and ended with oxidative stress. That's like blaming the meltdown on the traffic jam you see, without acknowledging the original car accident that sparked it. Reductive stress is the underlying culprit piling up those electrons. Once they start spilling over, they form superoxide, which is a real troublemaker. Superoxide. Not exactly the Marvel superhero you want on your side. So we have reductive stress as the spark, which ignites a bigger flame of oxidative stress. And the result is cellular mayhem. And that's one reason high blood sugar can be so destructive. It's not just about sugar swirling around in your bloodstream. It's how that sugar crams its way into cells, overproduces NADH, and triggers a domino effect that leads to damage of nerves, eyes, kidneys, basically any organ that'd like to continue functioning in peace. Now, I've heard it described that diabetes is like overnutrition. The body gets too many calories and doesn't know what to do with them. But more specifically, the mitochondria become less efficient. So they're kind of incompetent supervisors on the factory floor, letting materials pile up in the corner. The old explanation was, stop stuffing your face, your cells are overwhelmed. But the more nuanced view is, your cellular machinery might be broken, even if you're not overeating. If your mitochondria are slow at processing fuel, you'll end up with leftover sugar, leftover NADH, and a ton of chaos. You become Lucy in the candy factory, but you never get that comedic resolution at the end. The conveyor belt just keeps going. So that's the essence of reductive stress. It's an oversupply of those electron carriers. Then, ironically, that leads to massive oxidative stress when the electrons start leaking all over the place. Which is why you can't fix the problem by just throwing antioxidants at it. Sure, Antioxidants help mop up the mess after it's formed, but it's like showing up with a bucket to stop a flooded basement when the pipes are still gushing. You have to deal with the source of the leak. And the leak is that bottleneck in the electron transport chain, where NADH can't offload its electrons fast enough, right? Bingo. You've got an enzyme called GAP-DH in glycolysis. Normally, it acts like a traffic cop directing sugar breakdown down the main path. But when reductive stress piles up, superoxide inactivates that enzyme. The traffic cop is out sick, so the sugar fragments wander into weird side streets. And these side streets have ominous names. The polyol pathway, the hexosamine pathway, advanced glycation end products. Sounds like the dark alleys of metabolism. The polyol pathway first converts sugar to sorbitol, then to fructose, creating more NADH in the process, like adding more cars to an already jam-packed freeway. The hexosamine pathway slaps sugar-like attachments onto proteins, messing with cellular signals, and advanced glycation end products. Well, that's basically sugar glomming onto proteins like a clingy toddler, creating lumps of dysfunctional molecules. And every single one of those side routes magnifies the oxidative assault. So it's a vicious cycle. More electron buildup, more superoxide, more weird byproducts, more damage. Exactly. That's the hallmark of diabetes. Neuropathy, retinopathy, kidney issues, blood vessel damage. All from that initial jam of electrons. It's almost elegant in its twisted logic. So if high blood sugar is the constant flood, Reductive stress is the stack of crates in the hallway that triggers a chain reaction. And oxidative stress is all the breakable dishes that get knocked over. Quite an image. You really don't want to be the housekeeping staff after that. But here's the silver lining. 
If you target the electron buildup early, you can stop a lot of downstream chaos. Making sure the electron transport chain runs smoothly could theoretically reduce both reductive and oxidative stress. So that means focusing on improving mitochondrial function. If the cell can get rid of that electron traffic jam, it won't cause as many accidents. Am I following? Yes, Sensei. Better mitochondrial function, better electron flow, less meltdown. We can also think about compounds or nutrients that help push those electrons through smoothly. People sometimes look at CoQ10, alpha-lipoic acid, or even B vitamins. These are like well-trained staff who keep the assembly line moving. Or methylene blue, which can bail out some electrons in the electron transport chain. It's almost like an emergency lane on the highway when traffic is jammed. It can take some load off the main route, letting electrons bypass the usual congested spots. Methylene blue says, don't worry, I'll handle some of these electrons, so they don't all pile onto oxygen in the wrong way. It's a neat trick in certain conditions, though not exactly your typical kitchen shelf supplement. Still, the principle's there. We need to reduce that electron pressure. I'm guessing that's why controlling blood sugar in the first place is crucial. Because if you never have that sugar overload, you won't produce an army of extra NADH, and you won't back up your mitochondria. Exactly. Good old-fashioned blood sugar control is still step one. But the deeper insight is that if you only focus on the sugar and ignore the electron transport chain efficiency, you might be missing half the story. It's like letting fewer cars onto the freeway without ever building more lanes or improving traffic signals. So, in other words, one approach is to reduce how many cars enter, and another approach is to build better roads or add traffic lights that can handle the flow. Do both, and you might end up with a calmer commute. Sorry, I'm mixing metaphors, but it works. Traffic analogies always work for me, and that's exactly it. Both strategies can come together to maintain healthy cells. If we understand reductive stress, we're not just playing whack-a-mole with oxidative damage. We're tackling the root cause. So, we owe reductive stress a formal apology for ignoring it all these years? Perhaps. Scientists identified it in the literature before 1990, but it got overshadowed by the flashy drama of oxidative stress. Now we're seeing how electron overload and mismanagement might be the true epicenter of the problem. So let's recap in simpler terms. High blood sugar means too many electrons, which is reductive stress, and that sets off a chain reaction, culminating in oxidative stress. Then critical enzymes get disabled, sugar starts going down questionable biochemical paths, and you get a cycle of even more chaos. Meanwhile, tissues and organs suffer from that double whammy, leading to the notorious diabetic complications. If you can manage or reduce reductive stress, improve the electron flow, you might prevent the meltdown. That's the gist. Dr. Mercola's vantage point then is that we shouldn't assume it's all about oxygen radicals. There's this stealthy buildup of NADH that sets the stage first. And that's a game changer for how we approach diabetes or other metabolic issues. You got it. Now, to keep life interesting, that doesn't mean oxidative stress isn't important. It's still a big, rowdy problem. But behind the curtain is reductive stress, handing out too many electrons. If we only treat the after effects, we miss the opening act. Perfect. For those of us who want to keep the cell's assembly line running smoothly, the big picture remains. Keep blood sugar under control, support mitochondrial health, and consider nutrients that ensure we are effectively converting NADH back to NAD+. Exactly. And different methods exist. Some people look at dietary strategies, intermittent fasting, or exercise to enhance mitochondrial efficiency. Others explore specific supplements that make the electron transport chain a better bouncer at the Electron Nightclub. And if the bouncer's good at their job, fewer rowdy superoxide radicals get in. Great image. I'm just picturing a mitochondrion in a tuxedo, scanning IDs at the door. And turning away the troublemakers. That's the vibe. Because once you let in too many electrons, the party gets wild. Before long, you're dealing with broken tables, spilled drinks. In other words, oxidative carnage. I must say, I love how you can describe molecular biology in terms of a rowdy nightclub. You missed your calling as a stand-up comedian for molecular scientists. Thank you kindly but I'd probably be thrown off stage for telling jokes about NADH, not exactly mainstream comedy material. So, for practical takeaways, number one, realize that sugar overload is not just about sugar in the bloodstream, but also about what happens when it floods our cells. Number two, reductive stress is the first wave of trouble. Number three, controlling that initial wave can prevent the later wave of oxidative stress from damaging tissues. Think of it this way. If you're a property manager, you want to fix the leaky pipe before you end up with moldy walls. It's all about early intervention at the root cause. Nicely said. I suppose the best question is, how do we put this knowledge to use? Because no one wants that meltdown of electrons. We just want them to do their job quietly, producing ATP and humming along. We keep an eye on ways to enhance the electron transport chain. There's talk about cool Q10 or its reduced form, ubiquinol, which is basically an electron shuttle helping to keep the chain from backing up. Or alpha lipoic acid, which helps regenerate antioxidants. And then there's methylene blue, the electron getaway car. PQQ helps build new mitochondria. 
and B vitamins can fortify the system so you don't run out of key coenzymes. Because if the electron transport chain is the heartbeat of this system, fueling it properly can make a massive difference. Meanwhile, it doesn't hurt to keep your overall blood sugar within reasonable limits, so you don't invite that electron overload to begin with. Precisely. It's a tandem approach. The good news is that focusing on the earliest stages, improving the cell's ability to handle electrons, can have broad benefits, from inflammation to organ health, all in one fell swoop. And it all comes down to whether we're letting cells do their job efficiently. When they don't, it's Lucy Ricardo with an endless conveyor belt, and we're scrambling to pick up the pieces. That's the comedic visual, but in real life, it's no joke for those struggling with diabetic complications. It's a cellular traffic jam that can do real harm. So the message is serious. Shining a spotlight on reductive stress might help us find better ways to manage or even preempt the cascade of oxidative chaos. Absolutely. Well, Alara, I think we've made it abundantly clear that high blood sugar is half the story, and reductive stress is the other half that was missing. Now we can look at the entire picture. And hopefully our listeners see that focusing on electron management can open up new strategies. Because it's one thing to say, lower your sugar, and another to say, optimize how your cells use that sugar. Indeed. You can't ignore the internal assembly line. Each step has to be well orchestrated, or else it all collapses. So let's wrap it up. Thanks for joining us on Dr. Mercola's Cellular Wisdom with Ethan Foster and Alara Skye, diving into the rarely told tale of reductive stress. We appreciate you lending us your ears as we compared your mitochondria to jammed freeways, leaky pipes, rowdy nightclubs, and yes, Lucy Ricardo's Chocolate Factory. May your electrons run smoothly down life's highways. Until next time, remember to keep those cells happy, those electrons flowing, and those comedic analogies rolling. Thanks for watching. Subscribe now and click the notification bell so you never miss an update. See you in the next video.